Praise the Lord. We're going to pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this Bible study. Thank you for bringing us for a good thing tonight. We pray that what your purpose in the study of your word, you imply it and impress it upon every heart in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, that the study of the word will give us backbone, conviction, courage to do what you've called us to do in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, that our loyalty and faithfulness, our commitment unto you, will never waver in Jesus' name. Open our eyes once again, Lord, to behold wonderful and wondrous things out of your word tonight, that we may be able to have the transformation in our lives and pass it on to people around us. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome you to the Bible study tonight. We're studying from First Thessalonians chapter 2. We're looking at verses 17 all through to 20. First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 17. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? And not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and our joy. That's the passage we're looking at tonight. We've been looking at this chapter 2 for some weeks now. And in studying the uh, first Thessalonians chapter 2, we've seen the passion of Paul the Apostle. We've seen the interest of Paul the Apostle. And we've seen the desire that he had. And we've seen the commitment also. And the commission, the way he took the commission. We've seen in this chapter that a true believer like Paul the Apostle, a true Christian, genuine Christian like Paul the Apostle, will be a person that knows the Lord, not only know the Lord, will want to please the Lord, not to please himself, not to please any other one, and not to please society. Such a man is practicing the word of God, and such a preacher is reading the word, believing the word, imparting the word, teaching the word, preaching the word with a great, great motive. The motive that is pure, the message that is pure, and the ministry that is purifying. Those who read it, who read this word conscientiously, they will have conviction of the spirit and the leading of the spirit to do the work of the Lord, to please the Lord, not to please men or not to please themselves. Paul the Apostle was ever conscious of the fact that only the best is good enough for God and that God deserves the best. Not only that he deserves the best, he demands the best. That's why he said in this uh, chapter, first uh, chapter 2, reading from verse 7, But you are gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes a children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear, very precious, priceless unto us. That was his heart, and that ought to be the heart of every child of God, the heart of every preacher of the word of God, the heart of every minister and servant of the Lord. And because the Lord is worthy of our best, and he will not be satisfied with anything less. Abraham, the patriarch, learned this lesson when God told him to bring his son and to sacrifice that son whom he loved unto him. And he knew that God demanded that best and God deserves that best because of that. He did that. And since that time, all of us were children of Abraham by faith. 
walking in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, we must learn that lesson too. Paul the apostle, as a faithful son, a devoted son, a loyal son to this Abraham and a child of God, a minister of the gospel, he had learned this lesson too. That's why he said in verse 4 of this chapter 2, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men out of fear, not as pleasing men out of looking for a particular favor from him. He said, no, because our devotion is to God, dedication is to God, and our commitment is to God, our consecration is unto God. Because of that, we do everything we do not as pleasing men, but God. God also tries our heart. Then he tells us in verse 5, For neither at any time you sweet flattering words as she know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Now of men such we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, that we might have been burdensome as the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said in verse 10, Ye are witnesses, you know it all. And then God also, how holily, and justly and unblameably, we behaved ourselves among you that believed. That was the attitude of Paul the Apostle. That should be your attitude to you as a child of God and as a preacher of the gospel. That you concentrate on the Lord alone and you give everything you have got unto the Lord in service. We were willing, he said, to have imparted unto you not only the gospel of Christ and not only the gospel of God, but a very source because you are dear, you are precious unto us. He wanted to even offer more. That's why he said in verse 18, he said, Yes, we've offered everything we would offer the gospel, a life, a time. A talent, a very soul, if that were possible. But we even wanted to do more. Verse 18, wherefore we would have come unto you. Even I, Paul, once and again. But Satan hindered us. We have done more than we have done. Were it not for the hindrances we had. He wanted to do so much for those believers. I pray that that same heart and that same commitment, the Lord will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. You must be asking yourself, what's your purpose in life? You must be asking yourself, must all your plans end at the grave? There are many plans that end at the grave. And you don't go beyond the grave to go to eternity. And they don't benefit you or benefit anybody beyond the grave. Somebody asked a question this way. He said, have we no higher destiny, no higher goal, no higher focus, and no higher purpose than to build a nest in a tree that is marked for destruction? What he meant by that is this. Birds build nests. And when those birds build nests, they do not understand where the road is going to go through. They do not understand the project of the government. The road is going to pass through that place and they're going to cut down the tree. And that bird is busy uh, kind of building the nest on that tree that is meant for destruction. And there are many people that do that in life. The things they do, there are things that will go away with time. And God has marked all that for destruction. And the question is, have you considered your life? Have you considered what you do? Would you spend all your life in a destiny of focus, decision, just concentrating on building a nest on the tree that is marked for destruction? I pray God will save us from a wasted life in Jesus' name. We're dividing the study tonight to three parts. Number one, on diminished affection and passion for the church. On diminished affection and passion for the church, for the planting of churches, for the growth of churches, and for the establishment of those churches. Number two, on relenting adversary against the progress of the church. Satan is unrelenting, unbending, unyielding, unwavering, as he wants to hinder the progress of the church. As he is unrelenting with you, we're going to be unrelenting in Jesus' name. As he perseveres, wanting to destroy, we're going to persevere, developing the church that the Lord Jesus Christ died for in Jesus' name. Number three, uninterrupted anticipation for the prize that is coming. Uninterrupted 
anticipation for the prize at his coming. We're coming to point number one on diminished affection. They must have been wondering, they didn't see Paul the apostle for some time. As his affection for them flagged, diminished, gone down, as he become cold in his love. Why? Paul the apostle, where have you been? We've not seen you for some time. Oh, he assures them in verse 17, he had undiminished affection for them and passion for that church. Look at verse 17 again. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time, in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. He said the affection is still there. Opportunity has not come. The privilege has not come. But the desire, the passion had been there all the time. When he said, we brethren, he was referring to those who are born again, the children of God in Thessalonica. And he said, you have known the Lord. A heart is with you. You have come to know the Lord and you abandoned all your idols and all your evil and you're following after the Lord Jesus Christ our heart, our mind, our desires everything is actually with you are you not brethren? we're of the same family spiritually we're taking away from you for a short time we thought it would be a short separation Paul the apostle he felt a strong attachment to these Thessalonians and their sudden separation by persecution was emotionally painful it wasn't something voluntary if you go back to your Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 you will see that it was persecution that drew Paul and Silas as well as Timothy out of town and since that persecution separated them he had wanted to go back again minister to them again develop them again and lift them up again encourage them again but opportunity had not come. But then he told them that painful absence continued longer than he had thought. And he said it's only in presence and not in heart. What did he say that? He just told them in chapter 1. Look at chapter 1 verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers. Know that you didn't just physically didn't mean that we're forgotten you. We're making mention of you always in our prayers. Look at verse 3. It says, uh, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God. God and our Father. He said, you have been on our mind all the time. It's not like they say, out of sight and then out of mind. He said, no, not like that. He said, even though we were not in the same place together, it's only in presence we are missing one another. In heart, our heart is with you all the time. In our own case, it is out of sight, but not out of mind. In fact, he tells us in chapter 3, Look at chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, a brother and minister of God, and a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. He told them, our hearts have been with you all the time. In fact, it's like he told the Corinthians to you. Look at Second Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7, we're looking at verse 3. He assured them that actually they were in their hearts all the time. If necessary to die with them as well as to live with them. Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 3. I speak not this to condemn you. For I have said before that she are in our hearts to die and to live with you. That means then you still had the compassion of a father, the compassion of a pastor and of an apostle, of a church planter. He wanted to still be his best for them. And those of us who are leaders in the church of the living God, you are a leader in one area or the other. You have converts, you have disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ under your leadership. You must have the same heart, the same uh, kind of affection, the same love towards them, that even though you might not be together in the physical, 
then your heart, then your mind, then your prayers, and you're giving thanks for them every time, wanting to be your best for them, even though you are not physically together. It tells us it was Satan that hindered him, but he still had the mind night and day, remembering them, reminding himself that those people are there, and he needs to be his best for them every time. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm reading from verses 10 and 13. You'll see what he said when he said, Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. That was his heart. And that ought to be your heart as a child of God, as a soul winner, as a worker, as a fellowship leader. That the people in the house fellowship or as a youth leader, those young people, they're your heart all the time. And you're saying, oh Lord, I want to see them. I want to minister to them. I want to reach out to them. I want to be a blessing to them. I want to perfect that which is lacking in their faith, lacking in their conviction, lacking in their love, lacking in their faithfulness, lacking in their commitment. I want to perfect that which is lacking in them. Look at verse 13 to the end for the purpose. This is the reason I wanted to see you. This is the reason I wanted to be with you so that we'll be able to establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. That same mind should be in us, it should be in us in Jesus' name. His love was on flagging, his affection was on diminishing. Through Paul, the Lord had taught the Thessalonians to love. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. He said in chapter 4 verse 9, And Paul himself had been touched by the Lord and transformed by the Lord and taught of the Lord to love the church. What he expected of the church in Thessalonica, he also was practicing. And then he said he was willing to impart his very soul unto them. The power of God's love in Christ recreated him. And he took away all the hatred he had for the church before. The Lord gave him a new heart. A heart softened by love. A heart made radiant by love without limitation. Affection without reservation. And charity without hypocrisy. Let's look at First Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 5. We'll see the expression of his love, the expression of his affection, the expression of his devotion to this church of the Thessalonians. In chapter 3, verse 5, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent you know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. He said, the reason my heart has been with you, I know the way we went out of Thessalonica. It was because of persecution. And I knew that evil men will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And I know that those tempters, the people that tempt, they're not going to relay. They're not going to yield. And because of that, our minds have been with you. Have they been tempted? Have they backslidden? Are they still in the faith? Are they not in the faith? It was because of that. Our minds have been with you. And if we could make it, if there were no hurdles that we could not cross, we would have been with you. Look at verse 6. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now, we live if you stand. Think about that. You could have said, we live because Christ lives in us. We live because we believe the word of God. We live because we are born again. We live because we have the joy that we are going to heaven. He said, but we live when you stand. We're so much interested in you, in your Christian conduct and Christian conversion and Christian character and Christian commitment consecration that when we see that you are measuring up to the expectation of the Lord, we live if you stand fast in the Lord. We're looking at Philippians chapter 1. The same thing he felt for those Thessalonian believers. He felt for the Philippians as well. Philippians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of 
Jesus Christ. He said, that's the confidence we have. And that's the assurance we have that he has begun a good work. What's that? Good work of salvation. What's that? A good work of turning them away from their sin, from their idols, and then to turn to the living God. What's that? A good work of turning them away from the past and making them to face the future. And he said, the confidence we have is this. God would not have started if he didn't want to finish. He's not a God who lays the foundation of a house when he doesn't have an intention to build a house. He wanted to build you up. He wanted you to be steadfast. He wanted you to be stable. He wanted you to get to heaven. That's why got you out of the world. He wants you to get to the land of Canaan. That's why I got you out of Egypt. And he said we have this confidence that you have started a good work in you. He'll perform it until the day of Christ. Even as it is me, it is suitable, it is fit for me to sing this of you all because I have you in my heart. You see that? What he had for the Thessalonians, he had for the Philippians too. He said, I have you in my heart. In as much as both in my bond, son, in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, is my witness, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Well, that is something from Paul the Apostle here. His commitment to help the Thessalonians didn't diminish his commitment to help the Philippians. There are some people that are one-sided in their love. If there are maybe about two, three, four, five locations for them to help or to lift up or to encourage or to enlighten or to kind of affirm and strengthen, then they concentrate just on one. And they, they are only in Tesnaika all the time. Turn around the time. And they pray for Tesnaika all the time. But Paul the Apostle said, Philippians, you're in my heart too. Philippians, I want to visit you. Philippians, I want you to develop in the Lord too. And that is what should be the heart of the overseer. And the heart of the local government pastor. And the heart of the people that have the overseer responsibility over many locations. You go to all those places, not just Thessalonica alone. And it says in verse 9, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in the knowledge and in all judgment. We're looking at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Colossians chapter 2. This apostle with affection, affection for every church. Affection for all the locations where the Lord had sent him to minister. Colossians chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 1. For I would that she knew what great conflict I have for you. And for them at Laodicea and for many that have not seen my face in the Lord. I see here Paul the Apostle is even talking to these people. He said, you have not seen my face. I wasn't the one that brought you to the Lord. But I've heard of you. I've heard about your faith. I've heard about your conversion. I've heard about your coming to know the Lord. I've heard about the church there planted and the church that is growing and strengthening over there. And I'm longing to even come unto you. Can you think about this for your own personal life, your own personal ministry? That it is not just Thessalonica alone that you are saying, Oh, I'm sorry, Thessalonians have not been with you. You ought to be sorry to you. You have not been in Philippi. You have to be sorry to you. You have not been Colossae. He said, I'm longing after you. Desiring to see you. As much as I want to see other people. Even the people in Laodicea as well. In verse 2 that their heart might be comforted. Being knit together. United together. Joined together in love. And unto all riches of the full assurance and understanding. To the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. God and to the Father and of Christ. So then he tells us that he has that same passion. Colossians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 12. Well, I need hear that it wasn't Paul the Apostle alone. There were all the ministers too that had the same passion. Isn't that wonderful that the co laborers of Paul the Apostle had the same heart? the same affection, the same passion as Paul the Apostle, and wouldn't it be wonderful if all the workers will have the same heart and the same passion, the same affection with their leader, that is all the people in the district, they have the same desire, the same passion, the same interest, the same consecration as a coordinator, 
that all the zenders and all the coordinators who have the same passion, the same desire, the same affection for the church of the living God as the group coordinator has. And all the leaders and all the ministers in the region who have the same passion, the same pursuit as the region of Asia has. And it should not just be the region of Asia alone running here and there and reaching this and touching this and getting that and planting that and raising up that, edifying this one. But we all have the same heart. And if all the region of Asia's will have the same passion, the same affection, the same desire, the same pursuit, the same consecration as the state of Asia's and the national of Asia's. And here is what we'll find here. Look at this in chapter 4, verse 12. A paraphrase who is one of you, a servant of Christ. This is not just Paul alone now. Some people say, okay, that's okay for Paul. We understand Paul, his vision, his passion, his affection, his commitment, his consecration. Not only Paul, the co laborers too. The fellow servants too. The people that got the gospel through Paul the apostle and then they went out with the same zeal. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he has a great zeal for you. Look at this. And for them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. It's telling us that these ministers of God in Bible days, they were not just passionate about one city. They were not just passionate about one location. They were not just passionate about one state. Not just passionate about one region. They were passionate about other church locations too. And that's a great, great lesson for you and for me. Our passion to help the church, raise the church, develop the church, strengthen the church, build the church will not just be for one location. It will be for all the locations that the Lord has put under our leadership and also our supervision. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. I will see the burning passion and the burning pursuit of Paul the Apostle coming out. And here is another place now. Again, I'm just trying to emphasize to you that Paul the Apostle, his interest was not just in one solitary location, Thessalonica. And you find him here now. This is uh, looking at Ephesus now. Uh, we're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, from verse 17. And from my letters. He sent to Ephesus and he called the elders of the church. Uh, have you seen Paul the Apostle? Thessalonica, yes, my passion, my affection is for you. Philippa, yes, my passion is for you. Colossi, my passion, my desire to get you developed and to grow. All that is for you. And the Laodiceans, my heart is with you. I want to be there to come and be of help to you. And then now in Ephesus, I want to be there to you. It's uh, opening your eyes to see that uh, you ought to concentrate on all the areas of ministry the Lord has given you. Have you noticed that there are some people in the church and uh, they only concentrate on one area? As fellowship is there, no, that's not my concern. I mean, this other area and, you know, evangelism is there. So when is that? No, that's not my part. I'm just in this area and then there's another thing that has been done in the church to get converts to know the Lord. No, that's not my heart. This is my area. Paul the Apostle is saying, oh yes, I love the Thessalonians. I ever want to impart my very soul unto them. But I love the Philippians too. I love the Colossians too. I love the Laodiceans too. And I love the people in Ephesus too. Love everyone. And be willing to stretch yourself. Distribute your time and give yourself to the growth of the church in all the locations where the Lord has given us opportunity to be able to touch the people over there. We're looking at verse 18 and when they were come from all those places uh, from Ephesus. It says he said unto them, you know from the first day that I came into Asia after the manner that I have been with you at all seasons serving the Lord with all the humility of mind and with many tears and temptations and trials which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews how I kept nothing back 
that was profitable unto you. But I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. Uh, you understand what that means? Publicly, mass evangelism, I was there. Publicly, open air evangelism, I was there. Publicly, that open air campaign, I was there. And then from house to house, I was there. That's what I'm telling you. Paul the Apostle, he just stretched himself out, distributed his time. And then he made use of all means to be able to reach everybody. When it's mass evangelism, yes, I'm there. When it's personal evangelism, house to house evangelism, touching people one by one, I am there as well. And then he tells us in verse 19, he says, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind, now with many tears and temptations. And then he goes on, he says in verse 21, testifying both to the Jew and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that the same passion the Lord will give to us. Look at verse 26. It says, Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I'm pure from the blood of all men. I was telling the people at Ephesus, you could have told them in Philippi too, the same thing. You could have told them the same thing too in Laodicea. You could have told them the same thing in Colos. You could have told them the same thing in Nike. Because he just gave everything his God to every place and everywhere that he went. And you should be able to say the same thing. If you have about five children, you'll not be a good father. If all you do is, I'm educating the first one. Is the important one, is the central one, is the most essential of the children, and then all the other children are not going to school, and then you are training one out of five, and then you say, Hey, daddy, how about these four children? You know, I just love this child, Thessalonica, and I'm putting all my heart, all my effort, and everything I've got onto just that one. That's not a good father, and Paul was not like that. Not sectional. The same thing. All the people that are looking up to you, go everywhere. Teach the word. Preach the word. Rest the churches. Develop them. And show that your interest is not in just one location. Reach everywhere. I pray God will give us wisdom. Then it says in verse 27, For I have not shown to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take it therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. All the flock. You understand that? As a state overseer, all the flock in all the regions. As a state overseer, all the flock in all the local governments. Move on. Move around. Go around. You touch this local government, touch that region, and touch that other region. Now that somebody is a state overseer for five years, and he's been only going to one region for those five years, and all the other regions have never, never seen him. Paul the Apostle said, the Holy Ghost has made you overseers over all the flock, and therefore you'll touch them, reach them, and go to them, and teach them the word of God. It's made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his blood. I pray God will use us. We're looking at 2 John verse 12. 2 John has only one chapter. 2 John, that one chapter, verse 12. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Here is John. You know, it's the same thing that all these other ministers had. Paul, the same thing. Timothy, the same thing. Silas, the same thing. Peter, the same thing. And then we have John here, the beloved, the same thing. And he says, I could have written to you. I could have sent a message to you by writing. But I want to see you face to face so that I will impart it to you. That he didn't say that your joy may be full. He said that our joy may be full. When I'm able to touch you and you are able to hear the message directly and I see that your life is moving on, saved and sanctified and strengthened and sustained by the power of the word. Then your joy is full, and my joy is full as well. I pray God will do it through us in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. Unrelenting adversary gains progress in the church. Unrelenting adversary gains the progress of the church. First Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 18. First Thessalonians chapter 2. We're looking at verse 18. Wherefore? 
we would have come unto you. Even I, Paul, once and again. But Satan hindered us. He was talking to the Thessalonian believers. And he said, here is the pattern of ministry. And here is the progress of ministry. Here is the way we should do ministry. He says over here, we would have come unto you. When you have converts, we should have gone unto them. When you have people in the house fellowship, we should have gone unto them. When you have a region under your leadership, we should have gone unto them. You know, there are some people that wait and they say, well, I'm here, I'm available. They know that I'm here, I'm their pastor, I'm their leader, I'm their overseer. If they have need and they recognize my value and my gift, they will come unto me. Paul the apostle said, no. It says, wherefore we, Paul and Silas and Timotheus, we would have come unto you. It says now, even me in particular, even I, Paul, once and again, not just once, but once and again, once and again, once and again. That means then, if you're a leader, over the household of faith, you see them once and again. You touch their lives once and again. You teach them once and again. You go to them to see them minister to them directly once and again. Even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. We'll talk about that later. Why did you go there? And why were they to reach those terrenians? Why was he saying, I wanted to come with Timothy? And Silas, and we would have reached you once and again. Again, let's think about our state of affairs. Um, it just happens today that we're studying about Paul, the apostle, happened to be an overseer over the church in Philippi, over the church in Colossae, over the church, also in Ephesus, over the church, also in Ternica, over the church in Galatia. And then you'll see that it touched all of them. It wasn't just talking about the eternal believers. It was an all-round person. And if you are an overseer, this is what we should do. That's why we're overseers. Overseers. Seeing over all those people. And what was he wanting to do? Number one, to evangelize the sinners. Evangelize. That's number one. The thing that was to do. And this is what should be in our hearts, in our mind. To evangelize. Number two is to establish the converts. To establish that these converts have come to know the Lord by your evangelism. And now you are going from place to place. And you want to establish them. Number three is to enlighten them. Enlighten the ignorance. Uh, you know, that, that's why it says, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning the people that are falling asleep, that you sorrow not as they that have no hope. Because as the ministers move around, as the overseers move around, as the apostles moved around, it was to evangelize, number one. Number two is to establish. Number three is to enlighten the ignorant. Number four is to edify, edify the church. And so as we move around and we say, I'm visiting Tesnaika today, I'm visiting Philippi the other week, I'm, Philipp, I'm, I'm visiting Colosse the other time, I'm going to edify the church, build it up, raise it up. Make them strong, strong in conviction, and strong in the Lord. Not only that, number five is to empower the weak, enable the weak. That the people that are weak, and their knees are weak, and their hearts are weak, and their backbones are weak, and do not have any conviction, empower them. Number six is to equip the workers and the ministers, so that after you have left, because you know Paul the apostle, with all these other ministers, Silas and Timothy, they were not living in Thessalonica, and therefore when they were there, they must kind of equip those workers there, and they must develop those workers there, strengthen those workers there, so that after they have gone, they will be able to continue the work, and then number seven is to enlist and to engage, enroll them in the work. After you have trained them up and after you have shown them what they ought to do, enroll them, enlist them, engage them. Remember, as we move around, as we supervise, as we are overseers over states and over regions, and we're not just concentrating on Tesnaka alone, and we're moving from place to place, here is what we do. Number one, evangelize. Number two, you establish. Number three, you enlighten. Number four, you edify. Number five, you empower. Number six, you equip. And then number seven, 
you engage, you enlist. I pray God will help us to do it in Jesus' name. Before I go to these other verses, let's look at this First Thessalonians chapter two. First Thessalonians chapter two. We're looking at verse eighteen here. In chapter two, verse eighteen, it says, "But Satan hindered us. But Satan hindered us." Uh, you know, that's where some people stop. Or they said, I wanted to do this, but you know, Satan hindered us. Go beyond that. Satan hindered him that he could not go to Tesnaika in the physical, but he took advantage of on that and he allowed God to overrule. That's why he wrote the epistle uh, to Thessalonians. He said, We couldn't come physically. That doesn't mean there's no ministry. That doesn't mean we cannot do anything. Satan is blocking this way. There are many roads in ministry. There are many avenues in ministry. There are many opportunities in ministry. And if the road of physical touch is closed, and Satan thinks he's hindering that, and he closed that road of physical touch, well, we can write. That's why he wrote the first epistle to them. And that's why he wrote the second epistle to them. In fact, you are going to find out there are some epistles we call prison epistles. When Satan thought he'll hinder Paul, he'll stop Paul, he totally blot out the opportunities of ministering. And then he was put in prison. You are going to find that when you look at the end of the epistle to the Galatians, it was written from Rome. That is, from the prison in Rome. You look at Ephesians written from Rome. And you look at Philippians, it's written from Rome. Look at Colossians, written from Rome. And you look at uh, 2 Timothy, written from Rome. All those places where it says written from Rome, it means that he was in the prison. Satan said, I'll not allow you to travel. I'll not allow you to go there. He said, good enough for you, Satan. But you're not going to hinder the work of God, our right. And what he wrote is beyond the Philippians, beyond the Colossians. What he has written has not benefited the church, has benefited the world for more than 2,000 years now. That means we'll take advantage over the hindrances of Satan. Give me a good, good amen. amen. That means you're not going to say, well, I'm not doing anything because Satan hindered me. Go beyond that. God will give you wisdom. Amen. And of course, of course, if he hinders you from going to Thessalonica, how about going to Macedonia? If you cannot go to Thessalonica, how about going to Berea? If he hinders you from going to that other place, how about going to Philippi and going to Laodicea? If he hindered you from going to Thessalonica, how about going to Smyrna? How about going to Philadelphia? Thessalonica is not the only place on earth. The sinners are everywhere, going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And therefore, if the devil is closing the road temporarily to Seneca, then you can go to other places and still keep on going, keep on going. And the work of God will be done through you and through me and through us together in Jesus' name. But he expressed his concern. There is thing why I wanted to come to this place and go to that place where I wanted to minister to them. We're looking at Romans chapter 1 verse 11. Romans chapter 1. And we're looking at it from verse 11. For I long to see you. Here's the reason why I wanted to go to Thessalonica. Here's the reason I wanted to go to Rome. Here's the reason I wanted to go to all these places. I long to see you. That I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end ye may be established. It says, the reason I want to come to you is because I want to come and establish you that the cheese that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and of me. Now I would not have you ignorant brethren that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you. You want to underline that in your Bible? I purpose to come unto you. I purpose to come unto you. If, you know, because we're studying Thessalonians, there's some people that will think everything is on Thessalonica. All roads lead to Thessalonica. All gifts must be manifested in Thessalonica. Everything, concentration and commitment, everything is on Thessalonica. No! It's everywhere. That's what the Lord is telling us who are pastors, those of us who are overseers, and those of us who are overseeing the work of God in all these regions and everywhere. It's everywhere. And so he says in verse 13, Now I would not have you to be ignorant brethren of brethren at Rome, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you. 
And then he says, but I was led hitherto. That means that the road was also closed for some time there. And so he said, all right unto them, all right unto them. Thessalonians, I cannot come now, but I'm going to write unto you. And then the Roman believers, I cannot come now, but I'm going to write unto you. When God gives an open door, the devil may fight, but you will win the battle. We're looking at chapter 15, reading from verse 21. Romans chapter 15, verse 21. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall do what? Shall understand. You understand what that means? It says, those who have never heard, those who have never heard, those who have never heard, those are the people, go to them. There are some people, let's say, for example, there are 20 houses in your zone, 20 houses in your community. And there are sinners in all those 20 houses. And there are some people that have never had the gospel in any of the, in some of those 20 houses. But you keep on going to only one house, only one house, only one house. Those people are receptive. Those people are nice. Those people are reading the Bible. Those people encourage me. Those people, they show that they actually want the message. How about the 19 other houses? Nobody has a right to hear the message twice when millions have not heard once. Nobody has a right to take double breakfast when there are hungry people that have not had any breakfast. Nobody has a right to have 10 clothes when there are people that are naked. They don't have any clothes on. What I'm saying is nobody has a right to have the robe of salvation, robe of righteousness put on them and on them and on them 10 times over. When there are people that have not had once of that robe of righteousness, robe of salvation. That's the reason why Paul the Apostle said, you have heard, I'll go to other places where they have not heard. You have known, I'll go to other places where they have not known. That's why it says in that verse 21, but as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming unto you. He said, I've been going to other places. I've been reaching other people. I've been talking to the people that have never heard, that have never known. I've been going to the people that are so hungry that they have never been able to have anything to take bread of life. I've been going to them. That's why I've been hindered from coming unto you. We're looking at Luke chapter 11. We're looking at verse 52. Luke chapter 11, verse 52. Unrelenting adversary. See what the devil is doing. Doing in the lives of many people, how he's hindering people, is a kind of a taking away the knowledge of salvation, the knowledge of the truth away from them. And that's the reason we need to go to them and not allow the devil to just blindfold them and to remain in their error. Luke chapter 11, we're looking at verse 52. Want to you, lawyers, I pray that this kind of woe will not come unto you. I said this kind of woe will not come unto you. You know, it's a serious thing when loving Jesus, when compassionate Jesus, when tender Jesus will bring a woe upon some people, judgment upon some people, indignation and wrath against some people. What angered him? What made him so unhappy about them that he said, One well, to you, lawyers, he says, For ye have taken away the key of knowledge. That's how Satan hinders, he takes the key of knowledge away. And it was a key of knowledge. Well, you don't have to be a theologian to know that the Bible is a key of knowledge. The word of God, the key of knowledge. And proper interpretation of that word, the key of knowledge. The knowledge of salvation. The knowledge of conversion. The knowledge of sanctification, holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. The knowledge of the coming of the Lord again so that we can be ready and prepare urgently for the coming of the Lord. These scribes, these lawyers, they took away that knowledge, the key of knowledge. For ye enter not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. That's the work of the devil. That they did not want to get into the deep experiences of the things of the Lord themselves. And the people that want to enter, want to experience, want to have, want to live their life, they are hindering them. And that's what the devil does. That's this we need to go to them urgently so that the 
people that they do not know they are left from right. They do not know about the knowledge of salvation. The key of the knowledge of the interpretation of the word of God had been taken away from them. So we can go unto them and reveal that truth unto them. That's the work of Satan. But Satan will not overpower us. He will not overcome you in Jesus' name. When the devil says, don't go, and then you sit down. When the devil says, I shut one door, and then you yourself, you voluntarily shut all the nine doors remaining. Because he says, there's no road to Thessalonica. I'm shutting that door. I'm closing that gate. And then it's okay, I'm not going anywhere then. I'm going to then shut all the other doors by myself. It means that you are Satan's assistant. And then you're doing the work of Satan for him. He shuts only one door. And then you close the nine doors remaining and you'll not go any other place. Or we'll go. You will go. Everyone will keep on going in Jesus' name. We're looking at First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, reading from verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary the devil as a running lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom receives steadfast in the faith. Get that door open by faith, by prayer. Receives steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto eternal glory, by Christ Jesus, after ye have suffered for a while. You understand? It was suffering for Paul the Apostle, emotional pain that he suffered because he couldn't go to Thessalonica. It was emotional pain that he suffered at that time, but it was for a while. And then the Lord said, Paul, you cannot go physically. Why don't you write by inspiration and write unto them? And then he embodied this heart. He had a release in his spirit and wrote unto them. And then establishment came. It says, make you perfect, establish and strengthen and settle you. We're looking at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Sometimes the devil uses his own ministers, the people that are following after him to hinder the publishing, the preaching, the propagation of the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 reading from verse 13. It tells us for such a false apostles those who are helping Satan to hinder the walk in Thessalonica. Those who are helping Satan to hinder the walk in any city. Those who are helping, assisting Satan to hinder the walk in any region. And those who hinder the overseers from going to the places they ought to go. It says that these are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great sin if his ministers also transform themselves as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I pray that you will not assist the devil in any way in Jesus' name. When the Antichrist comes, that's exactly what he will do. He will try to hinder the worship of God, the preaching of the gospel, the propagation of the gospel. And the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work even now. That mystery is already at work to hinder people from receiving the gospel and to hinder the preachers from preaching the gospel and from going everywhere they ought to go to publicize, proclaim, and propagate the gospel of the Lord. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 7. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. That's the work of Satan. Mystery of iniquity. And then it says, Only he who now let us will let until he be taken out of the way. It's because the church militant is still here. The church triumphant is still here. And the church that is going out everywhere. And the church that makes the great commission, the priority, that church is still here. The church that makes the preaching of the gospel the number one thing to do, the essential thing, the indispensable thing to do, is because that church is still here. That's why the devil is not able to actually hinder everything everywhere in the preaching of the gospel. It says, and then in verse 8 shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the walking of Satan 
with all power and signs and lying wonders. That's what the devil does when he tries to hinder the preaching of the gospel. You receive some, some people that uh, they have this fake uh, power, this uh, counterfeit power, this occultic power, this power of darkness. And people will say, well, what are we looking for again? There's miracle there, there's miracle there. But look at verse 9, it says, all power, signs, and lying wonders. The wonders that deceive. The wonders that make people blind to the truth. The wonders that make people to forget that all those things do not save. Then it says, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. That's what the devil does. He gives some occultic power, evil power, dark power, magical power, sorcery power. He gives to all these people. And then the people that are going there, they say, well, I don't need any other thing. I've got everything all. And they're not saved. And when you try to preach salvation to them, the devil is bringing hindrance because their minds are blocked to the truth, to the truth of salvation. And it says over here in verse 11, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. These are the people that now rejoice in their unrighteousness and rejoice in their evil. Because they are blind, blinded by the devil. Second Corinthians chapter four. I'm reading there from verse four. Second Corinthians chapter four. We're looking at it from verse four. You know the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. That's how he hinders the preaching of the gospel, the penetration of the gospel. The God of this world, referring to Satan, he has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shall shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves for your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. God in the face of Jesus Christ. Revelation, I'm looking at chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and we're looking at verses 9 and 13. Revelation chapter 3, looking at verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Satan will be conquered. His hindrances will come to an end. All that he's trying to do to hinder us from preaching the gospel in Thessalonica or in Philippi or in Rome or any other place, the Lord will crush that rebellion from Satan in Jesus' name. It tells us in verse 13, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. I have ears to hear, I have heard. I said I have heard. You'll make use of what you have heard in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. I'm reading there from verse 17. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrines which you have learned and avoid them. The way Satan sometimes hinders the preaching of the gospel and hinders the proclamation, progress of the gospel is that he'll be bringing contrary idea, contrary opinion, contrary doctrine to the things which you have learned. And the Lord is saying the way you overcome that Satan, when people bring something contrary, you avoid them. I pray God will give you obedient hearts. In verse 18, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good works and fierce speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil, and the God of peace shall do what? Bruce Satan under your feet shortly. He will do it. I said he will do it. 
you know, there are some people, the reason I read all these references to you is that there are some people, any good thing they want to do, they go back to false. Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, they say, Satan hindered us. They want to do another thing, and we're asking them, have you done that? They say, Satan hindered us. I say, ah, how long? Is Satan going to hinder you? If he's closing one door, are you just staying and standing by that one closed door? Your life, Satan hindered us. You sing it in song. You pray it in prayer. You make the confession, Satan hindered us. Me, I have overcome. I said I have overcome. You'll overcome in Jesus' name. For the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And those closed doors will be opened in Jesus name. We come to point number three now. In point number three, we're looking at uninterrupted anticipation for the price at his coming. First Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 19 and 20. First Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 19 and 20. For what is our hope? or joy, or crown of rejoicing, and not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming, for ye are our glory and joy. Paul the apostle said this is what gives him joy. He's focusing on the future. He's focusing on the coming of the Lord. He's focusing on the reward that he's going to have at the end of the day. And that's what should be in your mind too. Focusing on the future, the reward you are going to have. And in the joy that you have, the crown of rejoicing that you have. Because you're looking at the things, not the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. First Corinthians chapter 9 verse 24. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race, run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that he may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. I therefore so run. Are you running? I so run, not as uncertainly, but and so fight, not as one that beateth the air. I keep my body under and bring it unto subjection. Lest by any means, lest when I preach to others, I myself become what? A cast away. When he says, I put my body under, what does that mean? Does that mean that you sew up your lips? No. Does that mean that you break your finger bones? No. Does that mean that you injure your backbone in yourself? No. It's saying, put them under control. Your eyes, what you see. Your ears, what you hear. Your mind, what you think about. Your feet, where they go to. Your hands, what they do or don't do. Put everything under control so that all your energy, all the qualities and virtues in your life will be directed to doing what you are called to do. Your mind under control. Ideas will come. You cannot do this. Satan is there. Lion is there. Opposers are there. Persecutors are there. And terrorists are there. Detractors are there. Your mind will kind of generate a lot of ideas that will paralyze you. Paralyze you with fear. Put us in under control. And silence all that voice that will make you not rise up and get those doors that are open. Get through them and do the work of the Lord. I pray that your body will be under your control. You know, we're soul, spirit, and body. Soul, spirit, and body. And the body is just flesh and bone and blood. The body itself cannot think. It's the mind that thinks. The soul that feels. The spirit that is energized, that moves on, that is fired up with zeal. But there are some people, they allow their body to hinder their soul. They allow their body to hinder their mind. They allow their body to paralyze and deaden their spirit. And that's what Paul the Apostle is saying. He said, I'm not all body, I have spirit, I have soul. And I put my body under the control of my spirit. I put my body under the control of my mind. I put my body under the control of the zeal and the passion in my soul. Sometimes my body says, I am tired. I cannot get up. I cannot move. And my spirit says, get up. And then my spirit is going already. And then my body will follow on. 
Because it's your spirit, your mind that gets the decision made that says this is what to do and this is how to do it. And your body that is sluggish and you know, wanting to pull you back, put it under control and let it follow on after the passion and the zeal of your spirit and your soul. You'll make it. I said you will make it. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 13. Philippians 3 verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. What he means by this is I count not myself to have finished, accomplished, finalized everything. You know, there are some people, if they want one soul to the Lord in a year, they say, God, this is great, this is wonderful. It's like a finished ministry. If they do a successful crusade once in a year, Lord, this is marvelous. I never saw something like this before. Paul the Apostle said, after you've done all that, don't slow down. Don't allow the devil to stop you. Look at the future. Look at the sinners that are still there. And move on. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's telling us to move on, to press on. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy my crown so stand fast in the Lord my dearly beloved he calls them dearly beloved two times in that single verse and he says they shall stand in the Lord and stand in the faith and then he say when you do that then you are my joy you are my crown of rejoicing he's telling us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 2 Corinthians chapter 1 the reason they wanted to move on is so that it will be a blessing to the church all the time. And I pray that it will be a blessing to the church all the time. We're looking at it from verse 14 all through to verse 16. From verse 14, as also ye have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus is saying that the members shall count their pastor as their joy, their crown of rejoicing, just like the pastor shall count the members as his joy and crown of rejoicing. And in this confidence, I was minded to come unto you before that ye might have a second benefit. That's one of the reasons Paul the apostle went around. Ye might have a second benefit. Once again, let me talk to the overseers. Once again, let's say you have five regions for example you've gone to region a you've gone to region b they've got second benefit you go to region a again they get a third benefit and then you go to region a again they got a fourth benefit hey region b and c and d and e they're waiting they have not got a second benefit and these ones they're already getting a fourth and a fifth and a seventh benefit and so is Paul the Apostle is saying, Corinthians, yes, I've been in Thessalonica, I've been in Philippa, I've been in this other place too, and I've been in Rome too. Now I need to come to you because you need a second benefit too. And the same thing with our coordinators, and the same thing with our, you know, there are people that you have all these zones and all these house fellowships, and you just go here and second benefit and third benefit and the fifth benefit. Go to that other place too. So that they too can have a second benefit and reach their lives and touch their lives and go uh, to the other places that need a second benefit. And then when you've done that, go to another one again for a second benefit and to another one again for a second benefit. Now when you go for a second benefit, what do you do? Preaching salvation, 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 salvation. Every time there's a second benefit that is called sanctification. When you go to a place, what do you talk about all the time? Healing, 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 all the time. There's a second benefit. We call that sanctification. And it is when we give the people, all the people of God, everything that's available. Then it is when we're really being a blessing to the whole body of Christ. I pray God will give us wisdom. The Lord is revealing these so that will not be hearers of the word alone, will be doers of the word. And what the Lord is revealing to us, we're going to carry them out in Jesus' name. And let's look at verse 16. It says, And to pass by you into Macedonia. You know what Paul the Apostle is saying? Corinthians, don't think that when I come to you, I'm going to stay with you. 
I'm not saying that you're the only church I'm going to visit. I'm going to pass on to Macedonia. Then it says to come again out of Macedonia unto you and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. That already emphasizes what we've been talking about in this study tonight. That it's not just one location. It's not just one test maker. It's not just Corinth. It's not just Rome. And it's not just Berea. And it's not just Macedonia. We go to all the places and we have tremendous benefit to everyone in Jesus name. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. You want to have this joy at the end of the day, at the end of ministry, that God himself will say that you have run your race, you have done everything that you ought to do. First Timothy chapter 6. I'm reading verse 13 and verse 14. I give the charge in the sight of God who quickness all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witness a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The reason for obedience is because we're looking at the time the Lord will come. And we're looking at the time when he'll give us the reward. And then will there be joy and crown of rejoicing because you've done what the Lord expected to be done. Titus chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 13 and verse 14. Titus. We're looking at it from chapter 2, verse 13, verse 14. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. That's he might redeem us from all iniquity and to pray unto himself a peculiar people. What are they doing? Tell me out loud. Zealous of good works. Not lukewarm. Zealous of good works. That we're not supposed to be dead, inactive, passive, paralyzed, not doing anything, zealous of good works. Hebrews chapter 12. The Lord is telling us now how to do it and what to do and to give our life, a commitment, everything we've got to the ministry He has called us to. And to do it everywhere, not just Thessalonica. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith for the joy that was set before him. That's what makes us move on. That's what makes us preaching every time. That's what makes us enduring. That's what makes us going from place to place. That's what makes us to have a balanced ministry for the joy that was set before him. Endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're going to do it. The Lord has shown us today what we need to do and the Lord has called us to such a ministry like this that we ought to evangelize and we ought to preach the gospel. We ought to edify the believers and we do it with passion. Passion for further ministry to the church, in the church and with the church. And all that we have heard, the Lord has said, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. He said a lot of things to us today. We'll be doers of the word and not hearers only in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That tonight, all that the Lord has said, the passion we ought to have, the zeal we ought to have, the commitment we ought to have in the preaching of the gospel, we're going to manifest that zeal, manifest that passion. No lukewarmness again, no lethargy again, no deadness again, no passivity again, but zeal, passion. Power, fire, fervency within us. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Any area you see you've been flagging, lacking behind, lukewarm, apologize, repent before the Lord. See, you are sorry. You're sorry for being lukewarm. You're sorry for holding back. You're sorry for being lazy. You're sorry for being idle. You're sorry for being tied down. And you're sorry for giving excuses. I'm hindered by Satan. Hindered by Satan. Hindered by Satan. Hindered by persecutors. 
hindered by difficulty, hindered by trial. If there are ten doors and only one is closed, and you're standing behind just before that closed door all the time, all your life, other places are there, other cities are there, other doors are open, other opportunities are there. And the Lord is saying, I set that open door before you, which no man can shut. Sinners are many. If you are spoken to one sinner, and that one sinner is rejected, go to the next sinner. If you have reached one street, and that street is closed up, go to the other street. If you want to go to one city, and there's no privilege or opportunity of going to that city, go to another city. And not waste your life, waste your gifts, waste your opportunities, telling us every time, saying every day, saying every moment, opportunities in Thessalonica are not there now. Oh, you can write, you can phone, you can send the message other ways, reach out, evangelize, touch the lives of the people, turn them around. Let there be transformation in their lives. Preach the gospel to every creature, not only Thessalonica. Tell the Lord, O oh Lord, I will have undiminished affection, undiminished love, unfailing love for the people that need to hear. Hear the gospel, the gospel of salvation. Talk to them. Reach out to them. If you talk to one and they are resistant, rejecting, go to the next one. Don't waste your life on just one individual. Go into all the world. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. The Lord will strengthen you. Underneath you are the everlasting arms. Make you to prosper in the work of the Lord and make the work to prosper in your hand. Soul saved. Save people strengthened. Believers sanctified. The sanctified baptized in the Holy Ghost. Children of God, turn to soul winners. That through you, the Lord will raise soul winners, servants, sowers of the seed, sowers of the word. And you labor till the very end. You serve till the very end. You don't stop in the middle of the road. All through your life. Everything is called you to do. You say, oh Lord, help me. Never looking back. Never going back. Serving. Seeking the lost. Until the very end. Because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. Don't let that happen to you. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And the same shall be rewarded. The same shall be crowned. He that shall abide in the work of the Lord until the end, the same we love the praise of the Lord. Keep on until the very end.